Hey guys, it's Ryan, finding a path to financial freedom for the self-employed. So it's probably a sore subject this time of year, but I've been chatting with my CPA over the last couple weeks talking about taxes for last year. So for me, it's top of mind. I'm talking about capital gains. Despite my holdings being in the absolute dumper at this moment, they weren't last year and naively, or maybe better put stupidly, I cashed out a couple shekels last year without thinking about the implications. Now I find myself trying to understand what this screw up is gonna cost me. So this topic may be a no brainer for many, but it wasn't for me. So let's learn a little about capital gains and losses, shall we? Let's go. So as many of you know, despite many years as a business podcaster, our business centric show, Eggs the Podcast, is almost five years old now. This channel is brand spanking new, kicking off just a little more than three weeks ago. I hope it's clear to you when you listen and watch that I'm wholly committed to the success of this channel, and with your help, I hope to see it grow as quickly as the community will allow. That said, I spend a lot of time looking at the data, checking the analytics for trends, learning what topics seem to be performing best, and what keywords people are using to find the content. To that end, I'm excited to report that we're on the grow and on a path that seems pretty rapid to me. But if there's one thing I've discovered, it's that not only do people seek out this channel to learn about all things personal finance for the self-employed, but also to keep up on the pulse of Danish pop music. That's right. In an unsolicited fit of radical transparency, there is something you should know about me. I'm nearly 42 years young, and my favorite singer is a Danish pop star named Mo. I'll spare you the backstory for now, suffice it to say that I am very likely on the outermost rim of her demographic, but nonetheless, after discovering her music around 2013, I found her style really resonated with me for one reason or another, and simply put, I've become a super fan. Okay, obviously the, the data doesn't support this segue, so why am I bringing this up? Well, because today is Mo Day, of course. As I'm recording this, after nearly four years, Mo has dropped her new album, Motordrome, today, this very day. So as the aforementioned super fan that I am with whatever platform I've managed to cobble together, I wanted to bring this little bit of happiness to everyone who sees this video and encourage you to take a listen. You'll be glad you did. I'll share links below. Now totally exposed, guilty pleasures on the table. Let's get into the topic, shall we? Another quick preamble though, this one more to the point. I don't provide tax advice and this video sure as heck doesn't constitute it. I've done a little bit of research on the subject and this sums up what I think I know, but it may bear little resemblance to reality. That said, I'm trying my best and I hope you'll find this useful, but please, before you do anything I or anyone else on YouTube suggests, please consult with your tax professional regarding your personal situation. So what is capital gains tax anyway? According to the IRS, almost everything that you own for personal or investment purposes can be considered a capital asset. Examples range from your home to the stuff you put in it, like household furnishings. Additionally, stocks, bonds, crypto, NFTs, and more held as investments count too. Anytime you sell a qualified capital asset, tax will be assessed on the difference between what you paid for it, or your adjusted basis in the asset, and the amount of profit you make or don't make from the sale as a capital gain or loss. Typically speaking, an asset's basis is its original cost to the owner. There are different rules around gifts and inheritance, but that's a different video. So in summary, you have a capital gain if you sell an asset for more than you bought it for, and conversely, you have a capital loss if you sell that asset for less than your initial cost. Keep in mind too that the IRS won't allow you to deduct losses from the sale of personal use property, things like homes and cars, so you might as well get top dollar on those because they're not giving you a break if you don't. But in today's economy, you're probably screwing something up if you're not making money on your used cars or houses. Now that we know what capital gains is, let's talk a little bit about how much we're going to be shaken down for. Again, according to the IRS, the federal capital gains tax, the tax on profits you make from selling certain types of assets, including your crypto transactions, by the way, are assessed at rates ranging from zero to 37% with additional tax for those with higher incomes. What they ding you for will depend on a number of different factors, including annual income, revenue from all sources, your tax filing status, and so on. But one of the biggest factors in determining what you'll pay is linked to how long you've held the asset in question. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but before we do, let's look at an example of a crypto trade and how your taxes will be calculated. 
First, you need to understand how much money you've actually gained or lost selling your crypto. Your profit, as far as the feds are concerned, depends on what you paid for it in the first place, including any fees assessed by your brokerage or whomever. The math is pretty straightforward. Just subtract the cost basis from the sale price. So the higher the cost basis, the lower your profit. But this can be challenging to keep track of generally and with crypto especially. In some cases with crypto, you're dealing with currency in millionths of a coin, or perhaps you've staked your money somewhere and you're receiving a kickback beyond your initial investment. Either way, the equation gets more and more complex the more transactions you have to keep in order. In fact, my CPA has told me he's now seeing tax returns that are hundreds of pages long in order to account for all the crypto trading that's going on these days. So how do I calculate the cost basis on my gains or losses? Well, according to our pals at Coinbase, there are a couple of different approaches. First, with the highest in, first out cost basis method, or HIFO, you sell the crypto that has the highest cost basis to keep your gains and your taxes as low as possible. Last in, first out, or LIFO accounting, means that you'll sell the crypto you bought most recently. This can be advantageous when values are increasing. That said, if you haven't kept detailed records of the purchases you've made, you won't be able to accurately demonstrate to the IRS which crypto you're selling. In that instance, the IRS will require to use the first in, first out, or FIFO cost basis method. This approach makes the assumption that the crypto you're selling is the one you've held the longest. The good news is that if you use a reputable brokerage to purchase crypto, something like a Coinbase, Binance, or Crypto.com, they are doing much of the keeping track on your behalf and will provide forms for you to share with your tax professional. If you are buying coins outside of these marketplaces using digital wallets or other means, you may be on the hook for coming up with your own accounting, so you may want to get started crunching the numbers well ahead of April 15th. As we discussed earlier, the rate at which you were taxed can vary widely based on a number of factors like your income and how long you held the asset prior to selling it. The amount of time you hodled will determine if you have short-term or long-term capital gains. Again, citing the IRS, as it pertains to crypto, short-term gains occur when you sell or otherwise get rid of your asset after holding it for less than one year. When it's time to pay the tax man, you'll incorporate these gains into your regular income and then pay taxes on everything together at your ordinary income tax rate. Be aware, however, if your income is over a certain threshold, you could be subject to an additional tax called the NIIT or Net Investment Income Tax. The NIIT is an additional 3.8% tax on investment income such as capital gains, dividends, and rental property income. This tax only applies to high income taxpayers as defined by the feds as single filers who make more than 200,000 or married couples who make more than 250,000, as well as certain estates and trusts. As you might suspect, based on what we've learned so far about short-term gains, long-term gains generally happen when you sell or otherwise dispose of an asset after holding it for a year or longer. These gains are taxed at rates of zero to 20%, plus the NIIT for higher incomes, with the exact rate depending on a handful of factors. In general, however, it's almost always lower than the rate you'd pay on short-term gains. Most people will pay no more than 15%, and you may pay zero if your annual taxable income is less than $80,000. There are higher rates relative to the amount you make, but to get beyond 15%, you've got to be over half a million dollars filing married. So if you're already pulling down that kind of scratch, I guess you're used to paying a little more for these kinds of things. At the end of 2021, this looked like it could barely be a possibility unless you were really going for it on some suspect coins or risky stocks. But now in 2022, it's a whole new world for young investors who could be experiencing deep, while hopefully not permanent, losses. What if for one reason or another you need to sell an asset now, and you're doing so at a price lower than you bought it for? If you sell, trade, or spend it, whatever, but at a lower basis than you bought it, then you can claim a capital loss. If you ask me, this is more of a silver lining than anything, but losses don't have to be all bad. They can lower your overall tax bill by offsetting other income. Essentially, if you profit from one transaction but you lose money on another, you may be able to use your losses to offset your gains. Of course, this is subject to IRS limitations. At the end of the day, if your capital losses exceed your capital gains, the IRS states that the amount of excess loss that you can claim to lower your income is the lesser of $3,000 $1,500 if married, filing separately, or your total net loss shown on IRS Form 1040. A 
Additionally, if your net capital loss is more than this limit, you can carry the loss forward into later years. One last time, this is tax pro territory, so don't take my word for it. But the moral of the story is if you lose money, you may have some recourse. Remember, you only pay on the gains or losses you realize. So if you're diamond hands, this might not be an issue for you at all. But either way, whether you plan to hold or fold, the bottom line is that it helps to be prepared. By thinking ahead and keeping track of when and at what cost you jump into and out of the market, you can save yourself and your tax professionals a lot of time and headache. This is also the very best way to minimize your tax liability from capital gains. Thanks so much for watching. Click the like button if you haven't already. Also click to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified every time I drop a new show. If you find this content or anything available on this channel valuable, share it and spread the good word. Get $10 in free Bitcoin when you buy or sell $100 or more in crypto at Coinbase at the link below. And join me here every Tuesday and Friday for more. Happy Mo Day, everybody. We'll catch y'all next time.